state of fear, where terror is homegrown. Join us as we take a drive down dusty back roads and discover the obscure and dark history of this country, human and otherwise, that lurk in your backyard. Hello, everyone, and welcome to State of Fear, episode 49, West Virginia. Today, we're going to start off with some weird West Virginia facts. James brings us a story on the legend of the Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden. And finally, we get into... (laughs) Finally, we discuss the Clay Massacre and the Little Shawnee Amusement Park. I'm your host, Chris, and the other member of Wild Stallions is my boy, James. What's up, James? (laughs) What's up, my brother? How you doing this evening? Doing all right, man. Doing good. Uh, they're having a little fun. Can't wait for the, uh, getting today's episode. It's kind of neat. Uh, we got a little bit of audio to go with it, so uh, it should be a lot of fun. Fantastic. Yeah, we're getting to the end of it, man. We got, uh, what, we got this episode, and we just got two more, and season one will be a wrap. And that'll be it. I'm going to take yes. a break, and then we'll bring you a, a, a fascinating season two. Absolutely. Uh, I just want to take a quick second to uh, thank all the listeners out there. Um, the uh, the listens are growing day by day. It's fantastic. Uh, it's so great to pop on to our stats and just see all these new listens. And um, thank you all for that. And uh, also for the, the reviews, we or not the reviews, I'm sorry, the comments we get on YouTube. I love reading those. So um, speaking of which, we have a YouTube. Go check it out. Stay of fear. Uh, all our episodes are on there for you to listen to. Uh, give us a, a comment if you if you want. Um, I love reading those. Also, um, speaking of reviews, though, I do want to mention, uh, if you would, if you enjoy the show and you're listening, so I'm assuming you enjoy it. Um, although, <laughs> well, I would hope so. Yes. Yeah, I, I take it. If you've made it this far, you're enjoying the show. Most people who don't enjoy the show at least stop listening after like two minutes. So, uh, but if you would go, give us a review on your favorite podcast app, whatever it is, if you're able to, if not, go find one, give us a review. If you have access to Apple, give us a rating. We'd um, love it. And then if you don't have to give us a review, if you want to leave like a, a one word review that says, or two word review that says don't suck, that's fine. Uh, just give us five, <laughs> five stars. Um, and that really helps us out uh, to get noticed by Apple and all them. Uh, also, uh, we got a Patreon, uh, State of Fear, uh, patreon.com backslash State of Fear, all one word. We have three three tiers, super cheap, nothing over ten dollars a month, and ten dollars a month gets you everything the other ones do. Plus, you get uh, you get you get uh, early access to episodes. You get ad free episodes. You to get... me, ten bucks is worth that myself because I listen to other podcasts and the ads drive me nuts. I mean, ads the ads on on ours drive me nuts when I listen to ours on like Castbox or, or Spotify. <laughs> the ads drive me nuts. <laughs> Yeah, yes. but yeah, I don't. I don't like an episode starting with a with a massing gale douche. No, yeah. no, <laughs> no, hell yeah. no. Yeah, that, like if, if no. you're a guy, you instantly click. <laughs> <laughs> and what sucks Turn. is you can't you can't fast forward past the ads. That sucks. No, you can't. No, that really sucks. But yeah, you'll get ad free episodes of the uh, the show, uh, a bunch of other goodies. We're gonna start doing like some live stuff. We're gonna do some some um, bring some of the listeners on, uh, but in order to do that, you have to be on the Patreon. So go check it out on yeah. Patreon, and you'll see all that stuff there. And like I said, if you guys are YouTubers, you like listening to YouTube, it's an easier platform for you. If you'd be so kind, go look for State of Fear podcast. It's easier if you put podcast after it uh, in the search because it doesn't just come up. There's a there's a few other little things they they use that yeah. for. And give us a uh, if you would be so kind as to just click subscribe yeah you don't have to ring the notification bell don't, don't says, ring the bell don't worry about this, that just smash the bell all this just give yeah. us a uh yeah and then if you like one of the episodes give us a comment underneath it all helps the show is growing we appreciate it it's all organic we're not forcing it down anybody's throat this is all happening it's awesome we're having a blast and like i said this is just our first season 
We got so much more we're going to do. Chris was right. We are going to start doing some more live stuff. COVID screwed a whole bunch of stuff up that we had planned. But now that all that's getting in the clear and things are starting to wind down, we're going to get out. We're going to take care of that. We're going to give you all some great content for our Patreon as well as some free stuff. So uh, just thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We sure and as what's, hell appreciate it. What's funny is by the time you hear this episode, I believe we will have been back in studio together, but we have like two episodes left. So it kind of yes. sucks, but it's okay. <laughs> We can get together to do some uh, some some planning for next season. Uh, also, I want to mention, you know, I mean, it, it re- we really appreciate the reviews, we really do. I mean, the Patreon will appreciate more, obviously, because you know you get a shout out, you get uh, all the other stuff I mentioned. But we really appreciate the reviews because I listen to quite a few podcasts, and there are, there's some that I really like, and, and like the, the new Unsolved Mysteries podcast is fantastic. By the way, if you haven't listened to it, go check it out. The host they got on there, uh, Steve French, is a really good voice. Yeah, it's good, a good podcast. But anyway, these podcasts I listen to, I enjoy them. But then at the end of the episode, they always run through all the staff they have that work on their show. So they run through the researchers, they run through the producers, the mixers, the, the music people. And, you know, and it takes them two minutes to name all the staff that work on the shows. And I'm, I'm over here like thinking, holy crap, no wonder their shows come out A, consistently, and B, you know, the, the hosts don't sound like they're stressed out because they have all this staff doing this. We don't have that. <laughs> no. It's just me and James. That's it, man. Just the two. We do, our re- we do our own research. We do our own editing, producing, mixing. I find the music. It, all of it's us. So we are just two people doing this. We are not a whole staff. So we yep. really appreciate the reviews. If you really like the show, go review us. It'd be much appreciated, please. And it's true. Yeah. And I know we're, we're kind of going on about this, but this, we're trying to really drive this home the how, you know, the, the appreciation and stuff like that. And like he says, the information we get on these reviews helps us because if you've listened to the first part of the season versus this last part of the season, you'll notice how things have kind of evolved because we have taken some of the, uh, comments we've received and we've the tried criticism to as you, you can call them criticism they're criticisms that's fine we can call it as it is Com- criticisms comments whatever that's right but we're not going to change the format but we are going to be more upfront about the contents of the episode to help make you more aware of what you're going to be listening to so yeah <laughs> yeah because like i said i've been listening to podcasts lately and unsolved mysteries and this other one strange and unexplained uh, after every episode, they have like a whole list of people that they thank for all the stuff they do. I'm like, my gosh, if we had even half of their staff, man, we, we would be, you know, coming out probably every day, probably with all the stuff we have. But, yeah, you know, it's just two of us. We're doing it when we can. I got a baby looking for a house. But That's right. We still love doing it. And we still want to bring it to you guys. We get that. We, we get the listens. We know you're out there. You're listening. I see the numbers. Just give us a review. That's all we're asking. Please. Yeah. Simple, easy. And give us a review. If you want a, a X-File gift card, gift card, sorry, an X-Files postcard, I'll send you a postcard. <laughs> I ain't sending you a gift card. Well, yep. that might be for next season, but. Maybe. Yeah. So I'll send you a postcard. Hey, I'll send you a sticker. I'll send you a pin. You know, just review. Let me know you reviewed. Boom. Out to you. That's all you got to do. So that being said, let's uh, also talk about tonight's episode. Uh, so like I said, it's regarding the clay massacre in the little Shawnee amusement park uh, and the hauntings around the park. But before we get into that, why don't we go ahead and get into some of the weird facts of West Virginia? Why don't we? And before we do that, actually, I do want to say it was really hard to pick a topic for West Virginia. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, because, you want to talk about <laughs> an abundant wealth of crazy stories, cryptid yeah. creatures. Yeah, I mean, just West All Virginia stuff. is like it's 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 a virtual circus of paranormal. I mean, this, I mean, obviously, it, we got the Mothman. <laughs> That's the biggest one is the Mothman. Yeah. We got sheep squatch. We got chupacabra sightings. We got uh, the mummies of of the of Philippi or whatever it's called. Uh, the weeping woman statue. The Braxton County monster. I mean, we got there are so many things in West Virginia to go yep. over and to find one that. Like I, I hadn't heard of Little Shiny Amusement Park, so this, this was all new for me learning this. But to finally find something like that in West Virginia, I was like, okay, we'll do this first. Eventually, we'll get the Mothman because we both love Mothman. Absolutely love Mothman. Now, that's a badass cryptid right there. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so I just want to say it was really hard to find something, but I'm glad I did. All right, let's get on to the uh, weird facts. 
do it. All right, you uh, I think we, yeah, I start. So <clears throat> in Parkersburg, West Virginia, there's a graveyard statue that is in the center of a local legend. A statue known as the Weeping Woman sits in the Riverview Cemetery and looks over the Jackson family plot, relatives of General Stonewall Jackson. Legend has it that during a full moon, statues the statue stands up and wanders through the cemetery, weeping over the conflict between the North and the South. Oh, hell. Visitors... <laughs> visitors have reported seeing the statue move and the weeping woman has been photographed with her hands resting in different positions that is cool we need to go check that out on, on a full moon yeah no kidding. absolutely in west virginia it is legal to gather roadkill and use it for several purposes including a food supply yipe yummy but west virginia you know hillbilly capital of the world means my people oh yeah that's right when when the roadkill law was passed, the residents of Pocahontas County decided to celebrate their new source of food. They held a roadkill cook-off festival. Yes, you heard that right. A roadkill cook-off festival, which became a yearly event. Decades later, the festival is still going strong and features participants who share their favorite roadkill recipes. Yummy. Let me tell you what. That is the ultimate... Um, <laughs> That is the ultimate example of waste not, want not. Absolutely. Now, the archive of the afterlife is a museum in Moundsville, West Virginia, and a majority of the room is filled with supposedly haunted items from residual, sorry, residential paranormal cases and collected from here and there. Some say a few of these items have been more charged than others, such as the Annie portrait, the mutilated effigy doll, and the aforementioned execution cap. The rest of the room harbors funerary and mortuary items, which includes two embalming tables, one embalming pump, and two service display caskets. One casket is for adults, and the other is for infants. The funerary items are accompanied by an array of funeral home advertising and signage. Funerary is a word. Apparently. Until, until this night, I have lived on this <laughs> earth almost 54 years, and I have never heard that fucking word. I haven't either. No, that's, that's a whole new word for me. Funerary. I'm going to have to remember that. Funerary. Shit. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. On November 14th, 1970, the worst sports disaster in American history occurred when a Southern Airways flight carrying the Marshall University football team, its coaches, and several citizens crashed just short of the Tri-State Airport in Huntington, home of the university. Everybody on board lost their lives as most of the airplane's fuselage was disintegrated upon impact. The tragedy of the lost team and its subsequent rebirth was told in the 2006 film We Are Marshall, starring Matthew McConaughey. Tragic story, but what a hell of a comeback. And that was a fantastic movie, actually. Yeah, it's a good movie. Good movie. All right, let's get into some famous West Virginians. A couple famous ones I got here. I've got Don Knotts. Love him. Which... uh, Barney Fife or Mr. Mm-hmm. Mr. Furley uh, yep. was born in Morgantown and Steve Harvey, <laughs> the star of Family Feud, Kings of Comedy. The man is hilarious. He was oh, yeah. born in Welsh, West Virginia. And I've got Brad Dorif uh, from Child's Play, from an X-Files episode, uh, from Lord of the Rings. I mean, just all over the place. Sweet. He was born in Huntington. And then country star Brad Paisley was born in Glendale. Good music. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right, right but country oh. music took a, a a pop kind of turn. He was about one of the yeah. last ones that kind of stuck to his group. Well, because he was, he was pretty tight with George. So King yeah. George, you know, so. I agree. Uh, um, Paisley has, has some really great music for the yes, newer country music. Yeah. Indeed, ha. Huh? All right, bud, let's go ahead and get into your fun main or news story of the day, shall we? Let's do it.
I always want to, this part, I always want to go, good evening, this is Ted Koppel. <laughs> yeah, have, sounds very I want to get one of those ridiculous parted haircuts and stuff. All right, our story tonight is the Iron Maiden torture device or sin cleanser. Film at 11. <laughs> sin this cleanser? This is also, yep. Oh, Lord. This is from the Ripley's Believe It or Not, which I love very much. Almost as much as Metro.UK, but they haven't had really anything too sharp lately. It's a lot more fun, though. Yes, it is. Story is dated March 4th of 2021. The early Middle Ages have been dubbed the Dark Ages, unfairly considering nothing more than just that. A barbarous period of fascinating, terrifying relics like the Chand Flute, the Shame Flute, Due to the presum <laughs> the shame flute. <laughs> that sounds like <laughs> I don't euphemism. know, man. Sounds like a yes, euphemism. It, yes, it does. Due to the presumed lack of cultural advancement prior to the dawn of the Renaissance, many historians argue that this doom and gloom nickname is as inaccurate description of an era that was, in fact, an intriguing, vibrant time, marked by great social and economic change. However, knowing what curious contraptions came out of the Dark Ages, as we, Ripley's, believe the name is quite fitting. Cue the dreaded Iron Maiden. The Iron Maiden of Nuremberg. Throughout history, there have been contradictory accounts of this grim, vertical standing coffin laced with spikes and similar methods of torture. The most famous Iron Maiden legend, I always want to do the guitar thing, is that, oh, yeah, of the I- <laughs> is that of the iconic Iron Maiden of Nuremberg, which, alleged <clears throat> which alleges it was built at the turn of the 19th century and was later shattered by bombing raids at the end of World War II. The history of the Iron Maiden of Nuremberg is almost impossible to verify, as is the case with the alleged medieval use of the Iron Maiden in general. But this infamous instance of the device certainly proves a grim and fascinating tale to tell. Man, that's that's a tongue twister. Tale to tell to high tide. You did a great job, though. Initially known as the Nuremberg version, legend has it that this device was adorned with the bust of the Virgin Mary and utilized against non-believers. The Inquisition, it said, employed it against their victims, using a Nuremberg-constructed maiden designed specifically not to instantly kill, but to prolong pain as much as possible. Its blades were long and vicious, but carefully placed so as not to cause fatal damage to the body at first. (laughs) But wait, there's more. At, At first, yes. With the Iron Maiden, it's not simply about the puncture wounds or the repeated opening and closing of the doors. <laughs> that would suck. What but the, the hell? Is- I know, but the isolation, darkness, and silence in between. Yeah, that would suck. The Iron Virgin, for all its cruelty and horror, may not have simply been intended as a, as a plaything for the sadistic. As far as an inquisition was concerned, physical pain in this world was liberating and sin cleansing. I have heard about that. People self-flogging and stuff, you know, with those damn oh, things. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anybody ever saw, what was that uh, movie? Da Vinci with, Code. Uh, yep, Da Vinci Code. Mm-hmm. That dude beating the crap out of himself, putting the spikes. That was, uh, yeesh. That was Vision. Yep. The sufferer was perhaps absolved of their sins by this terrible treatment. The timing and truth to torture. However, as previously mentioned, the Iron Maiden of Nuremberg was said to have been constructed in the year 1800, placing it firmly out of the era of the Reformation. By this time, tourists with an interest in the macabre had to be catered to, and grim tales of such devices could be very lucrative. Figures. An Iron Maiden with the face of the Virgin Mary was a real showstopper as a medieval torture device, even if it may have actually been as has been reported, a simple exaggeration of the Schandmantel or a shame cloak, a barrel of sorts that unseemly members of society were forced to wear as a sort of mobile stocks. Some of the Iron Maiden's notoriety in popular culture can be attributed to Johann Philip Sabankis, a historian of the 18th century who wrote a dubious and dramatic account of the execution of a forger of coins in the 16th century. 
whether the maiden had existed and had been used prior to this, either the Iron Maiden of Nuremberg itself or a device of the same name is up for debate. But versions of the machine began to be created by those of vicious disposition. With that, it cemented its place in the public consciousness. The Inspiration for the Maiden The earliest mention of the device akin to the Iron Maiden can perhaps be attributed to Polybius. He wrote the Apaga of Navis, which was designed by the cruel tyrant Navis. He assumed rule of Lacedaemon after Machinita's death in 207 BC and set about consolidating his iron grasp of the ancient Greek city-state in the cruelest ways possible. Nabus is said to have wrested every ounce of wealth from his people that he possibly could, torturing those who did not yield to him in the most horrific ways. His wife, Apega, was the inspiration for the most grimly created of these methods. The, Ap the Apega of Nabus, a figure of a woman studded with vicious spikes in its arms and chest. Intoxicated victims were said to have been placed in a room with the ghastly statue and on touching it would be pierced by its many sharp spikes. Jesus. Why the hell would you t why the hell would you touch it? Cuz they're intoxicated. They don't know what they're doing. I know. They're the stumbling, of, bumbling. No shit. The Ap the Apega of Nabus or Iron Apega was said to have been a fitting homage to a woman as vicious, greedy, and bloodthirsty as her husband, but it was also fascinating creation. An elaborate system of switches is reported to have allowed Navis to operate this sophisticated contraption personally. <laughs> Jesus, godly. Yeah, no shit. Another example is the monstrous brazen bull. This story dates even further back to Phalaris and his rule of Acre. See, look at all these damn names. Acre. James, I gotta say, I gotta say, you pick fascinating stories. I really, I really enjoy them. You also pick ones with the most difficult, difficult. words in the English language. Ever. Every as time. You, as you can tell. Every time. <laughs> this story dates even further back to Phalaris as his rule of Acarus, now Sicily. Every bit as vicious a ruler as Navis, Phalaris was delighted when his sculptor Perilius presented his latest work, a brass statue of a bull featuring a complex system of piping and room for an adult human to fit inside. Wait, this it's is horrible. I've heard of this. Oh, yeah. I hate this one. It's reported that Phalaris delighted in trapping those who displeased him inside the device, steadily heating it over a fire until they perished in agony. The anguished howls of the victims were converted to bull-like roars by the pipes. That's some cold-blooded shit. Actually, it's pretty hot. <laughs> bum, bum, yep. Both Apega and Navis and the Brazen Bull make for a grim, fascinating tales, but the question is, were they real? Physical devices that were actually used? There are accounts that Phalaris perished in his own Brazen Bull after Telemachus seized power, but ancient Greek historians are also known to have told implausible or inaccurate stories of certain events. Were these hideous machines allegorical of the cruelty and greed of their quote-unquote owners? It's tough to know for sure, and the same is true of the Iron Maiden. Whether the Iron Maiden of Nuremberg was really used or not is impossible to say, but the strength of the legend around it speaks for itself. But, believe it or not, Robert Ripley acquired the Iron Maiden of Nuremberg during one of his travels to Germany. He is said to have carried the eight-foot-tall device all the way home to join his growing collection of exhibits. Shaped like a coffin lined with 13 sharp iron spikes, this piece continues to have a home in Ripley's collection today. And looking at the picture, yeah, it looks like the spikes only pierce the upper half of the body, like the yeah. arms mm -hmm. and the outer chest areas and stuff. Not lethal, mm -hmm. of course. No. But, yeah, anyway. legs just hang there. So, yeah, man, but that's the story. Man, I love that's that medieval cool. stuff, though. I do man. love that medieval shit. <laughs> they definitely got creative with how they torture people, man. Yeah, that 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 brazen bull. I hate that one. I've yeah, seen that used in movies and stuff, and that's just mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. It. horrible. We got to we have to make a stop at the museum when we get on our road tour. Yes, sir. Y'all yeah. think we're crazy, but we're going. We're doing it at some point. Yeah, it's happening. Yep. All right, but well, why don't we go ahead and get into uh, today's main topic? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Because I'm sick of all these big words being thrown at me. So I'm, <laughs> I'm ready for you to look goofy for a few minutes. <laughs> You gotta pick, gotta pick easier yeah. stories, man. <laughs> I'm trying, man. I'm trying. I'm trying to be yeah. interesting too. 
All right. All right. So as I mentioned, today's topic is on the Clay Massacre and the Little Shawnee Amusement Park. I hadn't heard of this amusement park, but apparently it's this really small um, rundown park that uh, was open for a very short time. Well, probably a couple of decades or so, but apparently had a couple of deaths on site. And supposedly the hauntings of the park are those deaths. Uh, but we'll get into that later. Um, it's been on, man, like four three or four different shows has uh, it now okay yeah including ghost lab with the Kling brothers um and we'll hear from them in a bit uh later when we get into the actual park but first we're going to discuss the clay massacre so mitchell clay moved onto 103 acres of land with his wife and 14 14 hear you i say i say boy 14 <laughs> children in well, this 1775 is West well this, this is 1775 as well Oh, that's true. There's no. no TV, no radio, no podcast, no nothing. No. <laughs> dark, dark rooms and lots of love going on, let me tell you. Yes, sir. Now, this plot of land that he moved on to was in the western section of Virginia. Because at the time, West Virginia was just Virginia. West Virginia didn't become West Virginia until 1863. Uh -huh. So, technically, it was Virginia... But it was in the section that would become West Virginia, which is why it's still be included in today's story. Now, cool. the family began to cultivate and live off the land. And for the next eight years, they prospered through a mixture of livestock, tobacco, wheat, an orchard, and a kitchen garden. In, the, in August of 1783, the Clays wanted to build a fence around a recently harvested grain stacks in order to keep his cattle from accessing them while it was out in the field or while they were out in the field, I should say. So Michael tasks his sons, Bartley and Ezekiel, while he went off hunting for the day. As Bartley and Ezekiel were busy building the fence, their sisters were at a riverbank doing the family washing while their mother and younger siblings were at home doing housework. Unbeknownst to all of them, a small group of marauding Shawnee Indians were making their way towards their land. They first reached Bartley Clay, who was shot dead instantly. The shot echoed through the area, reaching the girls down at the bank, who immediately took off for home. And their path led them to right where young Bartley lay dead. They ran into some of the Shawnee Indians, and one of the older girls, Tabitha, watched as one of the Shawnee attempted to scalp Bartley. Oh, damn. Being a, a, a rough frontier badass, she leapt into action and attacked the Shawnee Indian, <laughs> reaching, reaching for his knife. Unfortunately, she was overpowered and stabbed to death, and they were both scalped. Damn. Yeah. While well, all this was gutsy. going... It's very gutsy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jeez. absolutely. While all this is going down, Mrs. Clay watched helplessly from her house. At the same time, a piece of shit named Lincoln Blankenship came the call on the Clay house. Mrs. Clay begged Blankenship to jump in, shoot at the attackers, and help save her daughter Tabitha's life. Unaware that Blankenship would be the prototype for the cowardly lion, he turned tail and fled to the nearest town of New River to report the attacks on the Clay. History has not looked fondly on him since then. Well, he's a punk-ass coward. He's a punk. He, yeah, now, let me tell you something. He... Is a punk bitch. Yep. He's a definite punk bitch. Yeah, I ain't no punk bitch, but he's a punk bitch. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ezekiel was captured and taken as prisoner, and the attackers fled into the woods. Now, Mrs. Clay, also being a badass frontiers woman, managed to bring the bodies of Barkley and Tabitha into the house and laid them on a bed, and despite being completely distraught, gathered up her remaining children and rushed them all six miles away to the nearest neighbor's home of James Bailey to get help. Six miles. Six miles, man. Man, them were the days. I mean, yeah, it's bad. It's bad when when 
when uh, you know critical things happen, but that kind of spacing out nowadays be kind that's of what you're desire. looking for. It, that'd be desirable. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Mr. Clay eventually made it home and discovered his worst nightmare. Upon seeing his two children's bodies and no one else around, he assumed they'd all been captured. He left his homestead and headed to New River for help. He managed to make it to New River the next morning and reached Captain Mar Matthew Farley. Captain Farley gathered a posse together of men, including Mitchell Clay, Charles Clay, Mitchell Clay Jr., James Bailey, William Wiley, Edward Hale, Joseph Hare, Isaac Cole, John French, and Captain James Moore. The group went up to the Clay residence to bury the two Clay children, gather clues, and plan the next move. Now, from what they could tell, once the Shawnee left, the Shawnee broke into two groups. One went down the West Fork of the Coal River over Cherry Pond Mountain, and the other group went down the Pond Fork of the river that went down the other side of the mountain. The posse decided to follow the group that went down the Pond Route, the Pond Fork Route. They caught up to them at night positioned themselves both above and below the group on the hill, they, and they waited until dawn to attack. When morning broke, one of the early rising Shawnees spotted Edward Hale, and before he could warn the others, Edward fired and shot the native dead. However, the gunfire awoke the rest of the group. No. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Now, in the chaos that followed, two of the Shawnee were killed, and the final one wounded. The remaining native is said to have begged for his life, however, of, upon finding that Ezekiel was not with the group and remembering what happened to his siblings, 12-year-old Charles Clay killed the survivor. He killed him. He, 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 he killed my, killed. my name is Charles Clay. You killed my brother. Prepare to die. Prepare to die. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Since the posse chose the wrong group to track down, the group that had Ezekiel made it all the way to Chillicothe, Ohio. Holy shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Damn. Boy, That's a long screwed, way. Yeah. They screwed the pooch. Oh, let me tell you, they did because once they got there, they tortured Ezekiel and then burned him at the stake. Oh, oh man. Mm-hmm. If I was Ezekiel, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be pissed. <laughs> I, I would, I would come back and haunt every member of my family be, I being would. I, idiots. Relentlessly. Relentlessly. Oh, yeah. Now, the two clay children were just the latest to be buried on the land. According to lore, the land was once the site of a large Native American settlement and burial ground that thrived far before European settlers. As many as 3,000 Native Americans are thought to have been buried under the park. Whoa. The land sits empty for the better part of 100 years until the 1920s when a Conley T. Snidow, 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 Snidow. Nidow. When Conley <laughs> When Conley T. Snidow bought the land and began erecting it an amusement park, Snidow knew nothing about the bloody history of the land and built a swing set, Ferris wheel, racetrack, concession stands, dance hall, cabin for overnight stays, and opened up the pond on the land for swimming. Oh no. There's a lake right nearby, but the lake has always been closed for swimmers. The park became a popular attraction for coal mining families in the area, and soon it was filled with laughter of children. However, it seemed that the land wasn't done with taking lives. Not long after the park opened, the deaths began. In all, six people died before Snydow closed the park. Just probably faulty rides and shit. <laughs> 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 well, we'll find out. But with that, let's take I a break. We will. Yes, sir. Well, hello there, little black kitties of the night. Come and join me, your host, Deadly Debbie, as we go through my creepy files and listen to real life, strange but true stories from people all over the world. Explore the weird and wonderful in my weekly podcast with Deadly Debbie's Creepy Files. 
The deaths included a boy whose mother left her son at the park in the morning. Plan to return later to pick him up. However, when she returned, he was nowhere to be found. After a search of the ground, his body was found floating in the swimming pool he had drowned. There was also a boy who drowned in the lake, even though swimming wasn't allowed in the lake. See, now what the hell? Who's looking at... Where are the parents? <laughs> they, they drop them off and say, have fun, yeah. bye, I'll be back later. That's true. I guess so, yeah. it's. Mm -hmm. I, I remember getting dropped off at places like that when I was... I did too, stuff. but I wasn't yeah. dumb enough to, get, to drown. The pool was quickly and quietly filled up with sand, and no one spoke of the death. Then, in 1966... A little girl in a pink ruffled dress met her end after climbing into the swinging, circling set. While on the ride, a truck backed into the path of the swing as the swing moved forward and, and killed her. The park was closed in 1967 after a failed health inspection. <laughs> of all it's things. Un, yeah, the rides are killing people, but this hot dog stand is filthy. Cl close mm. it down. <laughs> good one, good one. <laughs> Jeez, I guess the uh, the the sausage on a stick wasn't healthy. No, apparently not. The I mean, funnel, the rides were funnel, funnel cakes are all screwed up. Corn on the, the cobs, rides, the, all nasty. The rides were perfectly healthy, just not the hot dog on a stick. I guess, man. The ride sat there, rusting in the wind, vines and untamed grasses growing around them. Flash forward eighteen years later, a former employee of the park, Gaylord White, purchased the land and park with plans to reopen it. The original rides had all been sold off when the park closed, but White decided that the swings and Ferris wheel were important to the park. They purchased a Ferris wheel and a set of swings from New Jersey. When they ran the serial numbers, they found that what they had was the original swings from the park. Ooh. With the core of the rides in place, the Whites added some smaller kiddie rides, paddle boats, bumper boats, and a stage for entertainment. On the 4th of July weekend in 1987, the Whites had bands playing 24 hours a day, and with an admission of just $1, he said he thinks they saw close to 10,000 people. After three years, though, skyrocketing insurance rates forced the closure of the amusement park, and the Whites began holding fishing tournaments and other events to keep the property active. However, while working at the section of the land in the early 1990s, the bulldozer working in that section started digging up arrowheads, pottery, and pots. But no bones. Work stopped, and White had a team from Marshall U come down and work on the tract. Their work uncovered the Native American graveyard, digging up some 3,000 bodies buried there. Holy crap. So this is very much like the poltergeist story. Yes, it is indeed. In the mid to late 1990s, Gaylord, his wife Jewel, and their son Gaylord Jr., who passed away in 2013, began offering campfire stories and tours of Lake Shawnee during Halloween week. With so much tragedy and history in one place, interest in Lake Shawnee grew. Paranormal groups and ghost hunters began contacting the Whites for permission to visit. Now, White has claimed to have had experiences at the park. He says, quote, Sometimes a swing seat will start to move underneath your hand until you feel cold air blowing through the seat. Gaylord White, too, told the Travel Channel. And when you get to the middle, you find something warm. And we believe that's her spirit. He claimed to have even seen the little girl killed on the wheel, her dress covered in blood. Quote, she looked at me, and as long as she looked at me, I couldn't move, end quote, he said. In recent years, the phone calls have increased significantly as people read about Lake Shawnee on the internet. Those calls haven't just been from individuals, though, as networks such as the Travel Channel, Discovery Channel, ABC Family, and National Geographic have all filmed on site at Lake Shawnee. White has even, even done a phone interview with The Howard Stern Show. Everyone, he says, wants to know if Lake Shawnee is haunted. What's your definition of haunted, he asks. Quote, I don't have one, but there are strange things that happen here all the time. End quote. When the Discovery Channel filmed, White says one of its investigators got stuck in the old ticket booth and went into such a panic she had to go to the hospital in Princeton. Quote, she couldn't get out and was, she was yelling for help, end quote, he said. Quote, it was just a push door and she was pushing, but she couldn't get out. 
While Clay II won't speak of any personal creepy Lake Shawnee experiences, he does, however, say his father had an encounter with a little girl who lost her life on the swing years ago. Dad was on the tractor mowing the field, and he kept feeling a weight on his shoulders, White said. He didn't know what it was, so one day he felt the weight, and he turned around, and the little girl from the swings was there. She was in a ruffled dress, and she just appeared. He wasn't scared, but the only thing he could think of was, quote, Well, if you like this tractor so much, I'm going to give it to you. Here, take it, take it. <laughs> I, I, hey. You can have it. Leave me alone. Are you wanting to push you? Want me to push you on the swing? Just, just, <laughs> just don't kill me. <laughs> so he got off it and just left it sitting there. It's still sitting there where he left it in the late 90s. With the deaths of her husband and oldest son, Jewel White said she wasn't sure how she would continue to run Lake Shawnee. So she called upon her other children for assistance. Today, she and Chris, along with other volunteers, take care of the property, give tours, answer calls, and take care of the website. In 2014, Lake Shawnee's Halloween activities underwent a bit of a change as they shifted from Campfire Tales and Tour to the Dark Carnival Lake Nightmare, haunted attraction that went around the lake, swings, and Ferris wheel. The park also hosts paranormal tours monthly. Due to these local legends, the park was featured on television series such as Scariest Places on Earth in 2002, where it aired on ABC Family on the Part 5 episode of Most Terrifying Places in America, which aired on the Travel Channel, as well as Season 2, Episode 18 of Ghost Lab in 2010, and on the paranormal TV series Most Terrifying Places, which aired on Travel Channel in 2019. The Ghost Lab episode was released on November 27th, 2010, and right off the bat, let me tell you, James, these shows are terrible, first of all. All the shows are terrible. All the ghost shows are terrible. They're all terrible, in my opinion. All of them. <laughs> but it shows no. why these are terrible. So whoever edited this episode, and it was probably Discovery Channel, obviously, when they start talking about the deaths, they include graphics of a couple of newspapers with headlines recounting the two deaths that we described earlier, the the girl on the swing and the boy who drowned. Now, when yep. I was... I'm just Go gonna ahead. say I'm I'm gonna interject real fast. When it comes to the ghost shows, we I have it on inside authority on a couple of occasions. Uh, I've spoke to a couple of individuals who had shows. Uh -huh. Name na they will remain nameless, but uh, we're told that producers interfere with their production, screw with their evidence, and do all kinds of stuff. So I don't blame the shows. Uh, I don't blame the guys on the shows as much as I blame the people behind the production. But that's just my opinion. They screw with their shit. So, yeah. it, you know, it, it makes them seem hokey sometimes or overdone. And I can't stand that. And that's why I, I put that caveat that probably Discovery uh, edited the episode. Because, like I said, yeah. uh, in my research, I was unable to locate any newspaper headlines or any newspaper articles on the deaths. And when you see this episode, you look at the newspapers, the dates on the paper, first of all, look Photoshop. And second of all, a quick Google search reveals that the days of the week that are on the newspaper do not match up with the actual dates listed. So hit hit the buzzer, man. Hit the buzzer. We got the buzzer oh, somewhere. Got the buzzer. We got to hang already. <laughs> there it goes. Hell yeah, yeah. So the two papers are like Tuesday, May 17, 19, you know, 67 or some shit. But when you go look up that specific date, it's like a Saturday. So it's not even real. So they, they, they made these papers up. And, and again, it's Discovery. And that's why these shows are terrible. But suffice to say that they interviewed Gaylord Jr., who claims to have seen a little girl in a pink dress who was covered in blood. His daughter, Frankie, also claims to have seen a little girl. Now, we're going to hear a couple of clips from uh, that episode. The first one uh, is the team. The team captures what sounds like chanting in an EVP. Now, it could be far away. Who knows? But here is that clip coming up right now. Oh, my God. Sounds like chanting. All right, so what do you make of that? I like it. Pretty cool, that, huh? That sounds pretty damn cool, man. I like that. Yeah, I agree that that sounds definitely like chanting. So, yeah, so they captured that. 
then they go on to you know do the more investigation or whatever so it's interesting that they're talking about the land and how and they find out you know it's it was previously native american land and all this stuff and they talk about maybe like there's a curse in the land and they bring up another curse the curse of chief cornstalk from point pleasant west virginia and they mentioned that the curse of chief cornstalk might have had something to do with two plane crashes a toxic chemical spill and the fairmount coal company disaster in that area but they make no mention whatsoever of the bridge collapse nor mothman at all that's just wrong it is because I, i've there have been a couple documentaries who have mentioned that perhaps mothman was part of the chief cornstalk curse you know so why not bring it up i don't know man because we so ain't then, writing the show i guess <laughs> exactly discovery done done jacked it up we need to take so, over discovery and run that show yeah it's not discovery anymore it's just all ghost shit uh, so then they decide to activate the land and activate the land, I should say, by bringing a jump house and some carnival games onto the land and, and having them go sort of create what do you know? Remember what, it, remember what they called it, James? What was that? Whenever they um, recreate the noise and the energy of an area, what do they they had a special name for it? I remember what it was. Recreate the noise. Yeah, hmm. like they would, like in, in like a big band house, they'd have a band going to get the music going to help sort of uh, like. Oh, like in other words, they go back and they, they try to repeat. To yeah, see trigger they, object. It was trigger objects, what it was. Trigger, there you go. Trigger. Yeah. Yeah, so they do that with the carnival games. They, But the problem with this is, and again, it's the episode, each episode was two locations. So this, this episode the shawnee park was only the first of two so they only gave it like 25 minutes of the show um and i'm sure they didn't have enough time but they bring in this carnival stuff to activate the land to try and contact the two kids that were killed at the carnival however my problem with this is that they completely ignore the two clay children that were killed way before that so and and not only that but as I said, I couldn't find any any news stories about the kids that were killed at the park, but the Clay Massacre is historical fact. And the two kids killed on the land are historical fact. So they could have also done a trigger experiment to try, try and, and reach out to uh, Bartley and Tabitha, but they completely ignore any of that. They didn't even talk about the, the Clay Family Massacre. Um, Those bastards. <laughs> Well, again, it's it's it is what it is. But then yeah. they they do end up capturing another EVP of what's called a battle cry, and we'll hear that right now. In the same general vicinity, just before the EVP, you will hear us talking about the carnival. Whoa! Is that it? Did you hear that? Yeah. Highlight that highlight. area. Highlight. Wow! That's loud. Like a battle cry. Pretty clear battle cry. Kind of a sound. It's, you know? it, whatever it is, it's angry. So that do you hear that that cry at the end there? Hell yeah, man. That's yes. That's damn that's good EVP. That's, yeah. So that's what they capture, and that's pretty much it for the episode. Um the other shows, the most terrifying, don't really have investigations, they're just recounting what we did basically just the, the 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 massacre as well as the carnival or the 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 rides and that's whatever so there's no investigation there's no evidence to play but yeah man so that is the uh story of the clay massacre and the uh, little shawnee amusement park we need it's still it's still there the ride is still there um so again when we, when we take this fantastic um fucking field trip we're talking about we've got to go <laughs> and investigate the little shawnee park yep we, we, we've got to make a list of all this stuff and check it out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, man. So uh, I thought it was a pretty cool story. I had never heard of the park. Um, it looks like a cool place from the pictures. It looks creepy as hell. So, you know, I'm looking forward to eventually getting our ass out there. Hell yeah, man. Creepy is good, man. Creepy is yeah. good. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed the episode. i um, looking forward to Wisconsin next week. Yes. Um, got some fun planned for that. In the meantime, what can they do to support us, James? 
Well, my friend, we have our Patreon page, and if people would like to go there to support us, it's patreon.com forward slash state of fear. We have three levels, as we mentioned before. We have one, five, and ten dollar levels. Uh, each level, of course, comes with progressively better prizes and access, uh, bloopers, all that good stuff. And also, please, 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 if you watch YouTube, if you do YouTube, go to there, find our podcast, go ahead and click subscribe. You don't have to do the notification bell. I always hate when I say, click that notification bell, blah, blah, blah. You just mash the subscribe button for us. Anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows it, if you would be so kind as to take the time to either review individual episodes or review the show as a whole, we'd appreciate that as well. All this stuff helps us. Like I said, our listenership is growing. Our, it's, it's steadily growing. And for season one, we're very pleased with the results so far. Again, like I said, you know, it's just me and James. We, we do the whole show. We do this show and what the suck. We do the research. We do the writing. We, well, not the writing. We, we create the outlines for, for the topics. You know, and and I mix it all later. So it's just two of us. That's it. Not a whole crew of of, of stuff going on. That's um, it. So, you know, <laughs> you want to hear? Do you do you like what we're doing? Let us know. If you don't like, still let us know. Just tell us something. So, all right, buddy. Well, why don't we head on to Wisconsin and see what kind of weird stuff they got going on over there? Cheese. Oh, Jesus. I'm gonna get me some cheese. Jesus, not weird. Jesus, fantastic. What are you talking about? <laughs> cheese. All right, hey, buddy. Man. We'll see you in, on the next date. Let's get on down the road, brother.